right, so we want to welcome everybody to the Angular Community Meetup. Um, today we're doing a pretty special one. We're doing the Lightning Talk Lollapalooza. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun today. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors before we get started. Uh, Brebug, ng-conf, Cypress, SDG Consulting, the NGXP Podcast, JetBrains, and This.Labs. Uh, we couldn't do it without all these sponsors, so, um, so thank you guys very much. Um, we do have a code of conduct. Um, if one of the other co-organizers could drop that link in the chat, um, everybody just have a look over it. Um, it's pretty standard. We want this to be a very welcoming place. Uh, we don't allow any kind of bullying or harassment. Um, if anything is, is happening, if you feel uncomfortable, please let one of the organizers know and we will take care of it. I don't think we've ever had an issue in the past, but I do need to bring this up before we get started. All right, so uh, today we will be doing the Lightning Talk Lollapalooza. Um, I think that's all we uh, have today for our introductions. Um, it looks like Jason is going to be late. So um, does somebody else want to introduce me? <laughs> I'll, be the, I'll be the first talk today. I'll do it. Um, just let me pull up the, the paper real quick. Yeah, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> All right. So Chris is going to talk today about conditional validators in reactive forms. He is a senior software engineer at Hero Devs. And he Chris has over 13 years experience in full stack software development through various industries and tech stacks. Outside of work, he enjoys the outdoors, including hiking and camping. So uh, we have one question for you real quick, Chris. If you were the captain of a pirate ship, what would you name your ship? <laughs> yeah, this is a, a tough one. Um, yeah, Brooke sent this to me last night, so I've been thinking about it. I had two ideas. Um, more on an on a angular side, I was thinking like, well, how can I make this like pirate sounding? So I came up with the, uh, the route guard. <laughs> Ooh, nice. That is a good one. That's much better than, um, than I would be able to come up with, so. <laughs> it, it's tough, yeah. I was thinking about it last night at dinner. Um, the other one I thought about was um, I have a dog named Penny. Uh, she goes on all of our outdoor adventures. She's a beagle. Uh, so I was thinking like the uh, the plundering Penny. <laughs> oh, that's a good one too. She would be our mascot. She'd be on the flag. Yeah, <laughs> those are really good. All right, well, we will go ahead and turn the time over to Chris and uh, hear what he has uh, prepared for us. All right. Yeah, so as Preston said, I'm gonna be talking about conditional validators in reactive forms today. Uh, if you don't know what that is, I will explain with a short story. This is a story about a world famous hacker. Uh, we don't know his name, but we do have a photo of him. So please be on the lookout. Uh, there's this guy right here. Uh, in this story, he was attempting to get into a website. Uh, but he was too young to do so without his parents' permission. Um, so he went to the website and he's like, all right, email and age, no problem. So he typed in his email, but as soon as he put in his age, he realized that there was a third form field that appeared asking for his parents' email. And this would send an email to his parent asking for permission. They'd have to confirm it and let him in. Uh, so he decided he was going to look at the source code and figure out how this works and see how he could get around it. So he goes to GitHub, it was an open source project, and he found the login form class. And this class just held everything related to the form for the login page. Uh, had two properties, a form group and a minimum age set to 13. And then the constructor, constructor is set up the form group with three form controls, the email, the age, and the parent email. So let's look at the actual presentational component that displays the login form. Uh, all it's doing is injecting that login form class into the uh, constructor, and it has a template. Within the template, we have our three form controls. Uh, we're using a material or Angular material here, um, but in the first control for the email, uh, line two, we have our label. Line three, we have our input for typing in the email address. And in line four, we just have an, ink, an error that would display if the email was not in a valid format or if it was omitted completely. The next control was the age. Again, we have a label input and error, uh, nothing special here. But the third one is the one that is in question. 
and this is the parent email. So line three, four, and five, again, look the same with the label input and errors. Uh, but line one, we have it wrapped in this ng container. And we have an ngif checking to see if the age that's been set into the age form control is less than the minimum age allowed in the website. And if it is less than that age, then we display the form field. Okay, so the hacker had an idea. He's gonna do something that no one's ever done before. He's gonna lie on the internet. So he goes to the website and changes the age to 15. The parent email address disappears. He tries to log in, nothing happens. There's a bug on the site. As you can see in the, uh, the debug statement below the login button, uh, it says that the form is not valid. Uh, so what's causing that? You may have caught this earlier, but when we were looking at our login form class, the parent email does have validators stating that it is required and it requires a valid email address. Um, but in this case, the parent email is not displayed. The, NG, the NGEF is taking it out of the DOM, but it's not actually changing the way the form is validated. So we need these validators to be conditional based on what the age is set at. So this is an open source product. So the hacker goes ahead and uh, clones it and, and uh, starts making some modifications. He takes out the validators from the form control to start with and tries to figure out a way that we can do this dynamically. He introduces the value change observable onto this class that we will then subscribe to later. And then he starts working on modifying the value changes observable on the age form control to do what he wants. So let's look at this in, in closer detail. So we get the value changes observable from our age control and we're gonna add a pipe. And this allows us to kind of add in reactive statements uh, when this value changes happens. So as age changes, this gets triggered. And within the pipe, we can introduce the tap operator and take, take that age value and do something with it. And in inside of here, we're going to set our validator logic. So the first thing we need to do is grab the parent email control from our form group. And then we just need to do a simple if statement. If the age is set and it's less than the minimum age allowed, we set the validators just like we did before. We have the required validator as well as the email validator. Otherwise, if the age is greater than or equal to the minimum age, we're gonna clear the validators. The next thing we need to do is we need to tell Angular that these validators have changed and we need to update the validity of the parent email control. So we can just call the update value and validity function on that control. So this keeps everything within our, uh, our, our form class. And within our presentational component, we're already injecting this into the, the, uh, the component and we need to subscribe to that observable. Instead of doing it in TypeScript, we can just simply put it into an async pipe on the template. Uh, this will allow Angular to handle subscribing and as well as unsubscribing, making sure that it's destroyed once this component is gone and preventing any kind of memory leaks. So once this PR was up there and merged, uh, the hacker changed his age to 15, the form was valid and he was able to log in. And that's it for conditional validators. I wanted to thank you guys for listening and thank you to the uh, meetup to allow me to speak today. Um, now I'll answer any questions. And if anybody wants to look at the source code for a project I used to build this, uh, you can find it on my GitHub. All right, thank you so much, Chris. That was great. I've used uh, conditional um, validation like that before and it's super helpful. So thanks for, for doing that and showing everyone. Yeah, no problem. Chris, uh, some people are asking while you're doing that, what VS code theme you're using? Uh, that was actually, I was actually using um, carbon now .sh, uh, oh. just for the examples. Um, so I think it was one of the default ones there. Um, it wasn't actually in VS code. Perfect. All right, um, if there's no more questions, we can move on to our next speaker. Hey, Marco, how's it going? Hello, it's going good. How are you, Chris? Doing very well. Uh, so this is uh, Marco Danny Mir Mirovich. Did I say that correctly? Yes. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> um, so Marco, you are an NGRX Action Group creator and you've kind of joined the NGRX uh, core team. Uh, also a senior front-end engineer at JobCloud and an organizer of the Angular Belgrade group. 
In his spare time, he likes to contribute to open source software, share knowledge through technical articles and talks, and play the guitar. Yes. Um, I also saw that you are going to be giving a talk at NGConf this year. Is that correct? Yes. I'm, I'm going to talk about another relatively new feature from Android Store package called Feature Creator. Oh, it's very cool. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I know several people on this call will probably be at NGConf, so we'll get to see you there in person. Uh, so our icebreaker question for you is, what movie have you watched more than any other movie in your life? Mm, I like Donny Brasco film movie. Okay, I, I haven't heard of that. What, yeah, what with Johnny Depp. Oh, Johnny Depp, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, with Johnny Depp. Nice, all right. Uh, well, I will turn it over to you and uh, give you your talk. Enjoy. Let me just share the screen. Okay. I hope you can see my presentation right now. So as Chris said today, I'm going to be talking about uh, Action Group Creator. We can skip this part because I'm already introduced by our host. So. Uh, let's first start, let's first see what is the usual way of creating actions in NGRX. To create an action, or more precisely action creator in NGRX, we can use create action function from NGRX store package. If we want to define an action without payload, we can simply pass action type as an input argument of create action function. If you want to create action with payload, we have two options. First option is to use this props function that is also part of the NGRX store public API. And we need to pass um, payload type as an input generic argument to this function. And the second, uh, let's say, less popular way of uh, defining an action with payload is to use props factory. So as you can see here, we can pass a callback uh, as a second input argument of create action function. And there are two common ways how we import uh, action files to another files. Uh, first common way is to, to use named imports like in this example here. And the second way is to create parallel files, define named exports, and then we can use these named exports where needed. But both these ways don't provide, uh, the, let's say, the best developer experience, in my opinion. Uh, because with barrels, we need additional files in our code base with some repetitive code. When we use named imports, we cannot take advantage of uh, IntelliSense in our ID because we need to manually type named imports. And if we now go back and take a look again at, at the actions file, we can here also notice some repetitive code here. For example, we need to copy the same action source for, the, for each action in this file. Uh, also, we need to manually enforce source event pattern, as you can see here for each action. And if we take a look at the event name and action name, you can notice that they are almost the same. So action name is equal to the camel case event name. And uh, what if, for example, we want to create a new action, new product page action, how we do that? Usually we copy the previous action, then change action name, action type, and action props. Uh, and when we do that, we can easily forget to change the action type, for example. Uh, if we forget to change action type, we will have two actions with, with the same type. Uh, which will introduce potential bugs in our system. But luckily, in development mode, um, NGRX will throw an error when we try to define two actions with the same type. But it will be much better to have to get this error at compile time instead of runtime, right? So all these things that I uh, now mentioned, all these disadvantages, let's say, of using create action function can be solved by using a new a function from NGRX store package called create action group. This function is, is imported, of course, from NGRX store package, and it accepts two input arguments. First is 
source of the particular action group. And the second argument is dictionary of events. Event is a key value pair of event name and event props. In our first example, we want to define action without payload. So to do that with create action group, we can use empty props function from NGRX store package. By the way, this is also a new function from NGRX store. If you want to create action with payload, we again have two options. We can use props function that we previously used uh, with create action. Also, we can use uh, props factory. So, uh, this is the let's say this, uh, this is what our products page action group contains. So actually, this object is generated by the create action group function. And here we have three actions because here we defined three events. As you can see, the name of each action is equal to the camel cased event name. So for pagination change, we define pagination change event here. And everything is strongly typed, of course. If we take a look at the action type, you can see that uh, create action group will apply source event pattern. So we don't need to do that manually anymore. As any solution, create action group has advantages and disadvantages. If we talk about disadvantages, more specific about limitation, with create action group function, we are not able to define an action whose action name is different from the event name, like in this example here. So we can do this with a create action group because with create action group, action name is equal to the camel case event name. Of course, we are able to do this with create action function. If we talk uh, about restrictions, uh, with create action group function, we cannot use, let's say, special characters uh, when we define event name. For example, we cannot use brackets, quotes, or punctuation marks. And in the end, I just want to show you how much code we can reduce by using create action group function. So on the left side, you can see products API actions that are de defined by using create action function. On the right side, you can see the same actions that are defined by using create action group function. Thank you very much for attention. If you have any questions, you can ask me in chat or feel free to reach me out on Twitter at MarcoSTDev. Thank you so much, Marco. Um, I think we did have one question, which was uh, just what version of uh, NGRX is this available in? Uh, it's introduced in NGRX 13.2 version. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're Great welcome. Uh, before we move on, I did want to uh, say just a couple things real quick. Uh, we are recording this event. So if you miss any talks or you're not able to finish it, uh, you'll, it'll all be available on YouTube um, sometime in the next week or so. Uh, the other thing is just to make it a little bit easier for us to find questions is to use the Q&A section in Zoom. Uh, sometimes things get lost in chat. All right, hand it over to you, Jason. Thank you, Chris. Um, today, um, I get to introduce uh, a good friend of mine, Marcus Ingvarsson. Um, he joins us from Sweden. Um, he's a recent graduate of Chalmers University of Technology, and he has a master's in computer science um, and, and engineering. Um, during his studies, he started working as a full stack developer at Consat Telematics on the west coast of Sweden. Um, and in his job, he builds tools for fleet and traffic management in Angular and .NET. Um, besides programming, Marcus enjoys traveling and has lived and studied in Canada and Argentina. That's awesome. Do you speak Spanish? Yeah, somewhat. I mean, Un poquito? Uh, <laughs> sí. That's awesome. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, um, don't, don't put me on. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, and, and I, can do, I, I can do conversational, but uh, I, I'm studying it a little to, to improve it. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. That's awesome. Um, so your icebreaker question is that um, you live in a, in a beautiful country. Right. Where is your favorite place to visit and why would you recommend it to other people? Yeah, so it's tricky. I, I feel it. 
Swedes are com- often poor at giving uh, tourists a guide because they always go other places because they, they you know, they tend to go to, to Spain and other stuff. So I had to do some research. I, I feel like it, it, it feels wrong to say that you should go, you know, to the beach and, and drink apple cider or something. You know, I'm from the South, but I feel like you wouldn't come to Sweden maybe to, to do that. But uh, it's a common answer, but Stockholm is really nice. Stockholm mm. is fantastic in, in the summer. Uh, it's a great city and you, there's lots of things to do. Um, you have the, uh, uh, the archipelagos, uh, which are uh, really nice. There are many islands you can see. It's, it's really, really pretty. Um, in the winter, I, I, I enjoy skiing quite a bit, skiing. Uh, and, and there's lots of different skiing resorts and places you can go. Uh, in the far north, uh, you have Lapland, uh, and uh, it, it's cool if you want to experience like a very Nordic uh, experience, you know, with uh, with uh, the northern lights and, and and all that. You know, wow, that sounds awesome. Yeah, so so many places. Stockholm is a, is a solid choice, but but the mm-hmm. north is of course to recommend as well. And of course, awesome. Highly, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for the recommendations. Um, yeah. Sounds amazing. But yeah. I'm gonna, <laughs> time for your talk. Yeah, for sure. Let me see. I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay, so uh, welcome to this talk on dependency injection in Angular. Uh, Angular 14 was just released and it provided some new enhancements to the Angular dependency injection toolkit. And it's been a quite debated topic on social media recently. But how did now dependency injection work in Angular? Um, maybe you're new to Angular, uh, perhaps you've been avoiding this part of Angular for a while now, or maybe it's been a minute since you dabbled in an Angular project. Either way, it's great to have you here. And after this talk, we will know uh, what is dependency injection and why we may use it, how Angular uses hierarchical injectors to provide dependency injection, and what dependency providers are. So what is dependency injection? Uh, it's a design pattern in which a class requests dependencies from external sources rather than creating them themselves. So most things in Angular are simply a class, including modules, components, and directives. And we can inject services in all these different types of classes. And a service could be used to fetch data from a database. Uh, You could use it to maintain state across different views. Uh, Basically, it it helps us to achieve a more uh, loosely coupled application. And a loosely coupled application makes it easier to test it, and it makes it easier to maintain and replace parts of it without having to break it. So this is what our first service might look like. Uh, it's just a normal class, in this case, uh, with a method called get app version. And a service needs to be registered somewhere. And in this case, we register it in our provider array in the app module, which is the root module of our application. Um, we can also register a service in the providers array of a component uh, or of a directive. I also want to mention that rather than using the providers array in a module, uh, we may use the injectable decorator and provide a service in the root or in some module. In this demo, we will register services only in the providers array, as I think it helps for the mental model of the dependency injection. But uh, one should be aware of this preferred approach, which can take advantage of the tree shaking. And here is how we might use a service. Uh, we inject the service in our constructor of the app component, and then we instantiate the local variable app version in our app component by calling the method get app version from our app service. So instead of making the component having to figure out what version the application is currently running, it delegates this task to our app service. And this service can be used really anywhere in our application. And that's pretty cool. So who provides the service to a component when a component is instantiated? So this is the job of the injectors of our app. And there exist two injector hierarchies in Angular. Uh, Modules will only use the module injectors, but components and directives will also use its element injectors. So for a component, uh, Angular will try to satisfy dependencies in its constructor by using its own element injector. So this local injector uh, will see uh, if the service it's looking for exists in the provider's array and component decorator. And if this is not the case, 
it will forward the request to the element injector of the parent component. And this is repeated until we reach the root component. And if no providers were found, our component will attempt to look for the dependency in the module injector hierarchy instead. Uh, I want to mention that there can exist child module injectors under the root injector, uh, which comes from other lace loaded modules, uh, but this is out of scope for today. Um, the root injector will contain all the services that were provided in our root module, naturally. And if the service was not found there, it will check to see if the platform module injector can retrieve the service. Uh, this injector contains platform specific dependencies. Uh, and if the dependencies were not found there, it will reach the null injector. And I think many of us has felt frustrated when we started out coding in Angular and were met with this message. Um, you were following along a tutorial, uh, your pizza app is popping, life's good, and bam, all of a sudden, everything stops working and you don't know what to do. But now we actually know where this message is coming from. So in this example, none of our injectors were able to find a provided service with a key of app service. And then the request reached the null injector and the null injector threw an exception. And that's pretty much it. So now when we know this fact, we just had to figure out why app service did not get registered in the way we thought it did. So previously, we just added our service in the providers array, but Angular allows us to be more expressive than that. So this is where dependency providers comes into the picture. So line 19 results in the same provider as line 20. Uh, the provide property uh, requires a key. Uh, this could be a service reference, but it could also just be a normal string. Use class takes a class reference, uh, which is used to instantiate the service when someone tries to resolve the dependency uh, with the key uh, of app service in this case. And that means that the key will kind of only be used as an interface in this case, and the class we give to the use class will be the class that is used uh, inside of the application. And it does not stop there. Uh, we can even provide a value, such as an object, uh, or even a function instead of a class. So if we provide a class to use existing uh, instead of use class, uh, rather than creating a new class, we will go and ask for an already instantiated class uh, from the injector. So uh, let's see an example. Uh, so here, the key is just a, a string called API URL. And depending on if we run our app in production mode or not, uh, we can provide a different API URL. So afterward, uh, we can inject the API URL string in uh, feature service perhaps that may need it to fetch data from our database. And it will select the correct URL, uh, depending on if we run on a local environment or a production environment. And the fun doesn't even stop there. Um, sadly, we are running out of time, but Angular also provides something called injection tokens. And we can use the injection token provided by Angular, such as the app initializer, which allows us to call a method uh, as the application is initializing. Uh, here, we set the use factory to use our init application method from the app service, and we provide app service as a dependency. And you can create your own injection tokens, and there are many more unique tokens that, that Angular provides, which I encourage you all to uh, discover for yourself. So now we know that dependency injection is a design pattern commonly used in Angular, which helps us to create loosely coupled architecture, allowing us to build more maintainable apps. Uh, Angular uses a hierarchy of injectors to retrieve an injected service to provide services on many different hierarchical levels. And dependency providers can be used to reconfigure services, which is an important tool when building great apps. So for further reading, uh, you should all definitely check out these sources. The Angular talk documentation provides some fine examples. Uh, the Coded Frontends playlist on dependency injection is an excellent source if you want to dig down more deep in any of the covered topics today. And uh, Kevin uh, Koiso also have a really good video on how we can use the inject function in Angular 14. Uh, 
please contact me on Twitter or LinkedIn if some questions were left unanswered or here in the chat, of course. And uh, thank you all for listening. Excellent job, Marcus. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was, that was amazing. Good explanation in 10 minutes of <laughs> dependency injection. So yeah, I, <laughs> it was rough. I, I hope I, I got yeah, at least a, a, like a bread first uh, dive into, into the topics. And uh, please check out the, the other resources. They are fantastic. Yeah. And if you want to discuss more later, I would love to, to talk to you about the different topics. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Well, we are moving on to. Um, I, I've looked up. I'm trying to figure out how to pronounce this. If I get it wrong, please correct me. Okay. I, the way I think it's pronounced is Adi Gom. Am I close? Almost, gom. Almost there. The end is almost silent, like you're saying chewing gum. Adi okay. Gom. Gum. Okay. Adi Gom. Okay. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. I, I need to learn how to pronounce names better, um, but uh, thank you for being here. Um, let's get thank into- Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's get into um, just your bio. You're a, a solutions designer, UI architect, and tech lead at Tech Labs 28 LLC. Um, I love this, that you you told us your first interaction with a computer was playing Pac-Man, um, <laughs> and you were more interested in knowing how it was built than how much fun it was to play. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's awesome. For the past twenty years, um, Adi has been has strived in building simple, engaging, and very intuitive consumer facing products. Um, and as a JavaScript tech lead and UI architect, um, he spends the bulk of his time producing intuitive systems that are easy to scale and maintain. Um, when away from the keyboard, um, he enjoys the Georgia outdoors with his wife and two daughters. To him, the unpredictable weather is a known issue that simply adds to the overall charm um, and he would not have it otherwise. Um, that's amazing. Uh, <laughs> as a father of two daughters, um, I, I, you can I relate. felt that. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. I love okay. it. Um, so your icebreaker question, um, just before we jump into your talk, is um, mm -hmm. which one of your favorite, which is one of your favorite summer activities and why? Summer activities. Um, since now I do have like a good insect repellent that mm. doesn't have DEET in it, I do a lot of biking and walking again. And I was able finally to get back to my old running days, you know, so nice. nothing like, nothing like John Papa's level of running, <laughs> but I'm getting there. I'm building up. I run uh, 15, mi 15, 15 minutes without stopping. And I was usually uh, out of breath at, at 45 seconds for the last two years. Oh, wow. So, so I'm building up, I'm building up that resistance again. And um, yeah, I even have the iPod, like old school, the one that has 160 gigabyte to just load all my playlists in there and just go out there and run and bike. That's it. That's amazing. Sounds great. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing. And I'm going to turn the time over to you. We're excited to hear your talk. All right. So uh, unfortunately, you're going to have to see me on profile because my screen is here for some reason. But uh, yeah. I'm not disrespecting any of you guys. Sorry about that. So today, uh, let me see. I'm going to share my screen. Let me know when you can see it. Okay, Jason, can you see? Can I, can, you? I can see um, your browser. Okay, great. All right. So this is, uh, we're going to be talking about learning and understanding Angular. So after a while, you kind of want to start going into it and like trying to understand this beautiful thing that is Angular you know, that got us all like uh, gathered here today. So this is just a string, but um, in behind the scenes, what we have here is basically an observable that is like, uh, has a filter and is only gonna fire or is only gonna go into the transform when we have an account status, okay? So I have a setup here that is gonna put like, you know, the account type, the account service, the account number, and finally the account status. So this would be a setup that maybe you would do in a testing environment, but just to get to the point. The thing though, is this whole thing has like the async pipe involved here that is uh, updating that string that we saw in the browser. 
But the async pipe has a lot of promises for us. It says that we don't need to subscribe. It will subscribe uh, for us. We don't need um, uh, to unsubscribe. It will do that for us too. Um, even if we change uh, with any uh, switch map or anything like that to a new observable, it will unsubscribe and subscribe to the new observable. So there's a lot of things that the async pipe is magically packing for us, you know? So uh, of course, when you come in and you have a lot of source code, I mean, example code, you just like do it and you follow blindly. You just pretty much going through the motion. But if you want to go into the understanding mode, you are like, okay, how does it do all of that? Can I look under the covers? And you're like, well, that would involve me looking at this angular source code or how do I do that? So why not? It's JavaScript at the end of the day, at least in the compile form. And even though the TypeScript can be a little like scary, but the compile form is JavaScript. Okay, so how do we find out a little more about the async pipe and all of these things it says that it has for us? Okay, so here I'm just going to go to our dev tools in the inspect element and I'm going to go to our source tab. Okay, and in our source tab in the page, we have everything that is involved in this page and I'm going to go to the vendor. And I'm going to say, okay, there is something called probably, and I think, uh, the previous presenter was saying everything is classes and, 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 and functions at the end of the day. So how about if we try to find out about the async pipe? So let's do class. And I think this thing is on the way, I think. So I'm not sure how to hide this. If you guys have any ways, yeah. Um, um, hide loading meeting control. Okay, thank you Zoom for making it very complicated. So let's do class async pipe. We are in vendor JS that has all of our compile code. We have like our styles and everything and we wanna find out more about the async pipe class. Okay. Um, and of course the typo in there is not gonna, so class async pipe. And then here we see that all of the things that you're gonna read in a normal like, you know, blog post or anything is gonna be right there for you. The async pipe, what it does and everything, you have it right there. This is the compiled version, the JavaScript version of the async pipe, you know? So this is great. And then you come in here and like I said, it's just JavaScript. You have a constructor with the ref, which is probably the component what it does and all those of this little thing. And then the cool part, the subscribe part, the subscribe block, you have the select strategy, which is something else we will talk about if we have the time, you know, the dispose and so forth and so on. But now how does it affect me? How does it like actually affect my code or anything like that? Here, for people who are uh, um, um, curious, the async pipe, marks the component for check. And that's how like when you subscribe, you have that, you don't have to do change detection ref and everything like that, but this is where it does it. But can I question this real quick? I can put a breakpoint. This is actual Angular code. And the moment that I put the breakpoint, it, it went out from vendor and went to common MGS and shows me the actual path of where this exists in the node modules. Wow, this is, this is great. Now, I wanna put a breakpoint here, but I'm gonna put an, a conditional breakpoint. And I'm gonna just say, okay, if it is not false for my this, that latest value, cause in my uh, observable, I just want it when like we have a certain value in there. So I'm gonna put this as my conditional breakpoint and I'm gonna refresh this. <clears throat> Uh, it went pretty fast, so is it running in here? Oh, okay, actually, um, let me edit the breakpoint and I wanna say not false instead of false. <laughs> let's see latest value, let's enter that and let's refresh. Okay, there you go. So now this pose in the debugger and you can see here, I can see that my setup, that what I was expecting for my 
uh, object to have, you know, the account number, the account services, everything is in here, you know, and now I'm putting a breakpoint inside the, the source Angular code. I mean, that's just amazing. And we can do way more than that. That's just like to give you a quick example um, uh, for this particular use case, you know. So that's one of the things that I wanted to show. The other thing is, if you want to learn about Angular, uh, be familiar with the Angular uh, source code. So if you go to Angular, Angular, what I like to do sometimes when I just like I'm doing my uh, having my coffee in the morning is just to go and look at the pull requests in the Angular uh, uh, repo and look at the ones that are closed. Why am I doing this? There was something about the standalone uh, pipes uh, that, that were gonna happen. So here I put a few filters, it's PR. The feature is in the common module and then the ones that are closed. And when I run this, I have 135 of them. And then here I see make the common module directive standalone. So when I open here, this is actually looking into how the actual Angular team is going about building their code, but most importantly, how they talk about it. What is the what is what is the thread in there? I mean, this is better than Twitter. <laughs> That's the only thing that is better than Twitter. Because now you can go in there, look at how like these things are put together. And then you're gonna find out new things in there that you have never seen before. But then if when it's time for you to build your own pipe, you have the, the, the perfect example of how to build a pipe. And then when you go to the, how did they go about like the testing, you know, you're gonna have the tests that are gonna be in there that will show you. So basically the, 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 the biggest change here is to change like the standalone true. But if you go to the testing side and you go to the NG class spec. So if I was to do it for my own pipes, now I see like how the Angular team is implementing like their testing, basically. And right there, now I can just copy and paste and then keep on exploring until I have understanding. Okay. The final thing I wanted to show you is AI is here. AI, not as in Alan Iverson, but as in uh, arti artificial intelligence. And we can use it to help us understand code. So this is the Angular project. I'm in the packages section, I'm in the common module, and I'm going to the async pipe. I have one of the extension called Denigma, and we can like share that a little later. And here I can just uh, right click and say, explain the entire file to me. And then the Denigma AI is gonna be thinking, give it a second. And then it's gonna explain you what the async pipe is. So. If you kind of want to like follow along, you can open the actual async pipe. And then here, let us just like put it side by side and say um, on the view here in VS Code, I will say editor layout and then split right. Okay, now I have uh, this and I have my async pipe and I have my code explanation, basically, so it's telling me, uh, so I think I'm on the spec file, but it's telling me here, line by line or block by block, what is this thing trying to do? So now, if I want it to be just a little more precise, I could go into the actual, and I think I'm just about to run out of time, but we have about 30 seconds. So I can go to my, not my test, but the actual file here in my source and I can go into my pipe. And then if I go to my async pipe, I can just take, for example, I wanna understand a little more what this like select strategy is doing. So I can uh, select this whole thing, right click and just say, explain the Enigma. So the Enigma now is gonna come and tell me something like the code is trying to create a new subscription strategy. And then that's how I got to find out about like the strategy design pattern that is part of the gang of four design pattern, you know? So I was like, what, what do they mean by strategy? Finally, strategy makes sense. And if you go to that reference, the design patterns, you'll see what it is about, which basically check, you know, what, uh, what, uh, what um, solution to use at runtime. 
But the cool part here that we're not talking about design pattern is that we can just highlight some code, use this extension, for example, and then find out a little more about it. So I think I'm at time, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it up there. But what I wanted to finish with is that explore, ask questions, you know, dig a little more. And at the end of the day, it might be scary TypeScript, but it compares to just JavaScript. That's it for me. Wow. Way to go. There was some amazing advice in there. The chat was uh, mind blowing. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's easy to see why you will be speaking at ng-conf next month. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was such a good presentation. Thank you. I really appreciate Thank for, it. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I'm going to turn things over to Blake Lamb, um, who's going to introduce our, new, our next speaker. Um, but I did want to mention that uh, we do have three speakers from ng-conf here today. Um, we have Marco. We have Addy, and we also have Preston. Um, so thank you guys for showing up and, and taking the time to speak to us. Thank you. All right. Um, our next speaker is going to be Camille Klebeck. Klebeck, uh, yes. OK, all right. I, I was hoping I was right there. Um, Camille will be speaking Almost to there. us about how to lazily load standalone components and configure it by using Injector. Um, Camille is a pragmatic software developer who knows when code is good enough and enjoys helping companies meet their business goals by using the Angular framework. Camille started with AngularJS and switched to uh, V2 in 2017, and since then tries to take advantage of the latest framework features. Camille is currently living in Poland, but works remotely as the lead software developer on Keldoc at NEHS Digital, located in France. So Camille, before we get started, we want to ask you one icebreaker question. Um, what band or musician would you be embarrassed to say that you enjoy listening to? Well, um, actually, I, I think I'm not listening to it anymore, but I did. Uh, I would say all of my friends are aware of it. Uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a band called Accent Accent to be precise in Polish, uh, and it's led by musician uh, Zenon Martyniuk, <laughs> and they play like disco polo, and somehow uh, it uh, helped me to focus when I was studying for my exams at the university, um, and yeah, it was very popular in nineties uh, in Pol in Poland, and. Uh, there's a fun fact like uh, I would say like people will uh, not many people would admit they they know it but whenever this uh, their song starts at the at the Polish wedding reception everybody starts singing it and nice. they already know the lyrics <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. that's awesome uh, yeah. Yeah, so, that's, okay well that, thank you it. thank you for being here and we're excited to listen to your talk Thank you for having me. Um, okay, I will try to um, share my screen. And let's just uh, put it into full screen. Yep, okay, I think uh, you can see it. Um, so um, today I'm going to talk uh, how to lazy load the standard component and how can you configure it uh, by using Injector. Um, but first, uh, let's start with a brief explanation. Uh, what is the lazy loading and why is it important for those who are not yet uh, familiar uh, with this term? And so the lazy loading is a concept of loading components or bigger chunks of code only when they are needed. Uh, because over time, um, our applications are becoming more complex, which increases their bundle size. Uh, and at some point, it's important to divide the applications into parts and then load and execute them when they are needed. And thanks to that initial bundle size that browser has to download and execute will decrease, which then in turn will result in better user experience. And for example, 
when you have like the e-commerce application, user uh, using search doesn't have to load all the code required to place an order. And bundle size is uh, like a important but a single part of overall application performance. And to know more and to uh, see how can it impact the business revenues, please have a look at the Why Speed Matters uh, blog post on web.dev. But moving on, how can you do it in Angular? Uh, so the first way uh, is to use load children option, which is available to you while defining the root configuration for a given module. Uh, in the past, it was like the only way uh, to load part of the application on demand. And to use it, you have to assign to a load children uh, property a function that will load and then return a module. But the main limitation of this approach uh, is that it's used to load whole feature models during activation of a specific uh, root path. Um, and despite this uh, limitation at Caldog, we managed to use the load children along with the named, uh, named uh, router outlets to implement um, lazy loaded uh, models. Mm, luckily, starting from Angular 9, uh, thanks to IV renderer, you can now load single components lazily. For example, when user clicks a button. And to do that, you have to first uh, define a container in your component template. And then you have to uh, grab a reference to that container uh, using viewchild. And then you will define the method that uh, load, uh, will load and append new component to the view. And such um, function will uh, use the import function to load component asynchronously. And afterwards, you pass this uh, component to create component method exposed by uh, view container wrap. And by default, uh, this component will be appended as last entry uh, in the container, but you can also uh, explicitly specify um, the desired uh, position by using uh, index option. Um, at the time uh, when your component was using any other model, uh, it was quite uh, cumbersome to, to make it uh, happen in Angular 9. Uh, but luckily there was uh, a workaround for that. And in that component file, you had to also create additional module that would declare component and import any other uh, required models. But with a release of standalone components, this is uh, no longer an issue. Uh, you don't need any workaround or boilerplate code. Right now, all it takes, uh, you have to just add standalone true property inside the component uh, decorator and then import any other required uh, models. The rest of the code stays the same. Um, but let's assume uh, that your component takes configuration by using a dependency injection. And how can you provide that configuration? Well, there are multiple options. First, you could use the root injector, in, injector which is a global scope injector available across a uh, whole application. Another way is to use model injector, but that would mean uh, creating a wrapper model just for that component uh, and in that case, we're trying to avoid that. And you could also use the element injector, but then the providers, the finder would be kind of hard coded and they would be uh, all the same for each of the component instances. And for our like example, we want more dy dynamic uh, approach. And there is another way to achieve that. You can create and pass your own um, injector and here's how you can do it. Uh, so first, you have to create injector using the static method create, uh, which takes a list of providers as an argument. Then you pass such created injector to create component method. Uh, but it's worth mentioning that this injector is detached from the dependency injection tree because we didn't provide a parent injector. But in this particular example, the injector will be attached to the tree 
thanks to the view container rep that will do it during the component creation. And as a result, our component will be able to inject any other tokens from the tree, not just these ones that we pass to the uh, create method. But then in such uh, an asynchronous environment, you want to make sure that your code won't be executed twice. It may happen that due to multiple clicks uh, on the button and network delays, that our function creating a component may be executed twice or even more. And to prevent that from happening, uh, here's an example, how, how can you deal with this issue? So you can create a lock decorator that will make sure you won't execute function again until the previous execution and the promise uh, has resolved. And optionally, of course, you could uh, extract the, comp the dynamic component creation to a service that will do a similar check. And code examples shown during this presentation are avail also available on my GitHub. Uh, so feel free to clone it and check how it works in practice. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Camille. That was great. Um, Thank you. Lazy loading is something that, that I've like learned a lot about, but definitely have a lot more to learn. And that was some good stuff. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. All right. Um, our next speaker is Nicholas Valdiva. Uh, Nicholas will be giving us a talk about design principles in Angular. Uh, Nicholas is a front-end developer with three years of experience working on web-based projects with a good understanding of the main processes to build and design applications. He loves to collaborate with team members and is always up to keep learning. So Nicholas, before we get started, uh, what is the strangest thing that you have in your refrigerator right now? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> That's a very, very question, but I guess probably butter of apple, maybe. Okay. But they're almost a uh, traditional food. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that's a good answer. So, okay. Um, time is over to you, and we look forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Sorry. Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk a little bit about design principles. This talk is going to be a little bit oriented to Angular, of course, but before I start, uh, we have to know that design principles are not particular to any language or to any specific framework or technology. Uh, design principles are there to be applied to any technology, to any language, so they are regardless the technology you are using. And that today's talk of objective is uh, how to face the idea of learning and understanding what are design principles. So it is going to be a little bit more focused to junior developers also. So let's start by the first topic, and it is what are design principles. So design principles are abstract recommendations about how to design your code. Okay, I like to say it twice because it's quite important to understand it. They are absurd recommendations about how to design your code. They are not strict rules to follow. They are not the strict implementations you have to follow and implement in your code. Design principles are not that. Design principles are there so as to have a very cold implementation that will allow your applications to be more maintainable, more scalable, and more flexible, right? Um, when I started studying design principles, uh, maybe some of you wonder the same question, that is, what does it mean by abstract recommendations? Well, we say abstract recommendations because these recommendations can be applied on very different ways. It is similar when you are working on a feature, on a solution, uh, that problem can have different solutions. Maybe uh, some solutions are better than others. So it's the same concept for design principles. The same principles can be applied on different ways, depending on the framework, the technology, the language. So design principles are not telling you how to do it, but what to do. 
that's the idea I had to understand before going on into deeper details, right? So design principles are not telling you how to do it, but what to do. So that's the key I, I like, I, I wanted to share with you because it's kind of, it's kind of helpful, right? So uh, the next, uh, the next topic I wanted to talk about is as a junior developer, is it important to learn about design principles or is it important to learn them before starting? Sorry, is it important to know about design principles before applying to a job or before building a project? So uh, in the Angular community is widely suggested to apply solid principles and another principle like don't repeat yourself, for example. But is it really important before building a project or before applying to a job? So the answer for this, from my opinion, is yes. As a junior developer, you should know about design principles, but you don't have to be a master at it because to be, to be honest, it will be very complex to know how to apply them properly at the beginning of your career. So it is better to take action. It is better to start building something first, to apply to a job, to get the job you were looking for, uh, but also be aware of what are the same principles and which ones you can use in Angular. So take a moment to study about design principles, um, but don't worry too much about going deeper in the details at the beginning of your career. Uh, however, design principles will impact significantly in your seniority level and also make a huge difference in your code quality. So my recommendation about how to study design principles is take it easy because learning design principles and recognizing where and when to apply them is kind of complex. So you'll master it just by practicing a lot, doing a lot of code, learning from others and be a constant learner. So the experience of working with different teams, with different projects on different scenarios will allow you to understand better what are design principles and how to improve your code quality. So we cannot have a design principles talks without talking about, talking about solid principles. So we are going to talk about a, what solid says, and we are going to start by the first principle of solid that is single responsibility. So single responsibility says that a class should have one and only one reason to change. The intention of this principle is to have items that are easy to understand their purpose. They explain themselves easily and it's easy to change, right? So that is what single responsibilities mean. The next one is the open close principle. It says uh, your logic should be open to extension but close to modification. But I also like to say make it easy for modification too. Because when you are extending the, the logic of an existing feature, you're most likely modifying some places. So it, it is not as easy as just adding code and everything is working, right? So I like to say, make it easy for modification too. The next principle is the least cop substitution principle. So it says all parent classes instances, instances should be replaceable by their child classes instances. This principle talks about inheritance and this technique mustn't break the application. It is mainly used when defining diagrams because it helps, it helps us to model good inheritance hierarchies. The next one is in the first segregation principle and it says a class shouldn't be exposed to properties or method it doesn't need. Uh, the objective of this principle is to reduce the size side effects of using larger interfaces by breaking them into smaller ones. And the last one is dependence inversion. And it says modules, modules shouldn't depend on concrete implementations of high or level load modules. So both kinds of modules, low or high level modules should depend on abstractions. We can use injection tokens, directives or services to accomplish that. So that's it. Thank you so much. You can reach me out by my LinkedIn profile. I'd be glad to receive some feedback and talk about Angular, of course. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nicholas. That was great. All right. So our next speaker now, 
I hope I say this right, Yaakov Chaikin. Close enough. Chaikin, Steve Silent. Okay. okay, Yaakov Chaikin. All right, so Yaakov is going to, to talk to us today about replacing NG Deep for good. Yaakov Heiken is a full stack developer and software architect with over 20 years of professional experience as both a developer and a team lead. He is, part, he is a part-time faculty member at the master's program of Johns Hopkins University, Whiting School of Engineering, where he has taught web development for the past 18 years. For the past six years, Yaakov's web development courses on Coursera.org have surpassed 800,000 students. He is also an open source developer. His latest project is Mongo Unit, which is a data-driven integration testing framework for Java Spring Boot-based applications that use MongoDB for persistence. The framework enables the developer to test the data access logic with relative ease. That's quite the uh, the career so far. That's that's pretty incredible. Um, so we have uh, one um, one quick icebreaker question for you. Uh, you teach as a professor at a university. From your experience as an educator, what advice can you give to developers as they set out to learn new skills and tech that you feel a lot of people don't know and or need to know about learning? And obviously, that's a pretty big question. So, if you uh, if you have just um, so, so you want me to give you a quick 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 talk on that before I <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you if you have some. Um, a couple of quick pointers. Yeah, on I, I, I would say the number one thing that I see all the time, and it's funny how that happens, I think, from the newbies to all the to advanced people. And frankly, it's happened to me as well, which is the ability to uh, ask a good question. You know, they say there's no such thing as a stupid question. That, that maybe is true, but there is such thing as a question that begs other questions. So, uh, you know, the proverbial, uh, proverbial uh, you know, uh, my code doesn't work. How do I fix it type of question where you're inviting other people to say, well, can, you, can I see your code? What doesn't work? What's the error message? What, there's so much that, uh, you know, people kind of have the, especially if you get scared by some error message or something, you, you know, pull back and start basically asking questions that make the, potential answer of your question work so hard just to understand what it is that you're asking. And that, you know, in our world where a lot of questions on Stack Overflow or online, you, you really are doing yourself a disservice. And I've done this myself because it's just a human condition. You're really doing yourself a disservice when you don't um, provide as much pertinent information about your question as possible because you're basically having, you know, if you put yourself in, in the shoes of, of the person who potentially might answer that, you know, they're scrolling and seeing a question and their mind is, hey, so I got to now ask you another five different questions just to understand what you're asking. And then I can maybe see if I can help you. You're putting so much kind of a, such a giant mountain between yourself and the actual answer that you're seeking. You, you're making them work so hard that a lot of times you just have these questions that are unanswered because, uh, you know, who wants to put in so much work just to ask you what in the world are you even talking about, right? So the number one thing I would say for everybody is, you know, calm down if it's a question that you're, you just lost about and think about how you can provide the most pertinent information to, you know, the world out there that actually would be invited and it would be easy for them to answer if they know the answer as opposed to making it, making it pretty hard for them to answer. So that'd be my... Perfect. Advice. That's great. I agree. Asking good questions is, is always important. So, um, all right. Well, we'll turn the time over to Yako for his presentation. All right. So what I want to talk to, uh, to you about is basically replacing the uh, pseudo class NGD for good. And for good, I mean, at least for now, within your own code. And somebody on my team actually figured out this. Um, I don't want to say it's a trick. It's because it's a very standard thing. Uh, should be at least nowadays. And we kind of started using it on our project throughout, and I think it's been it's been just great. So, but before we jump to that, um, Angular is a component-based architecture framework, and I think it's important to understand the the background a little bit. Uh, what is a component? Component, essentially, at least certainly for this context, is just a black box. 
I don't know how it's implemented and really I shouldn't have to know how it's implemented. I just want to be able to use something. It's no different than I would use an API. In fact, component API is our outputs and our inputs, right? We customize the component that way. Now, part of Angular, something that I actually absolutely love about Angular, which is uh, view encapsulation. So that's really part of that black box idea um, an idea behind a view encapsulation is that the styles of one component don't bleed out to the rest of the application, don't bleed out to other components. And that's really handy. I think uh, Angular was uh, very good to include that, not because it's just conceptually a good idea, but also it just provides so, so, such a much easier um, developer experience when you code. You don't have to remember that, oh, I named this class here this way, but I named this class maybe possibly the same in a different component, all that kind of solves the view encapsulation <laughs> solves that for you. So um, the point of view encapsulation um, is that, again, it doesn't bleed the styles of the component out to the entire application. Um, and let's, so let me see, uh, show you a quick example of what that means. So for example, we have two components, component A, component B, they're pretty much the same. And we're gonna turn on the view encapsulation of emulated, which is just emulating the shadow, uh, shadow DOM for our components, and uh, it's out, a little bit outside of the scope to um, to explain what that is. But uh, the bottom line is, components kind of live, at least in an emulated view here, they kind of live in their own little HTML bubbles, and they don't bleed out their styles outside. So you can see, I define two styles, or define one style and one component, uh, which is the hello class, and it's color blue, and the other one, it's the exact same hello class, and it's color green. So what view encapsulation, encapsulation allows me to do is that I'm able to put both of those components in the same template of the same uh, application. And uh, I have one hello angular in blue and the other one hello angular in green, meaning they don't step on each other. I don't have to worry about the fact that they're named the same. Angular provides and fixes that for me. It kind of makes the component live in its own bottle, bubble. Now the question, however, is, well, what if I need to customize that component styles? Because a lot of times you kind of do need to, and in practice, you do need a lot of times to customize them. So if you look at Angular docs, uh, here's what it says about customizing components. It says you should consider the styles of a component to be private implementation details for that component, which is kind of what, what I've been kind of saying. And then it adds when consuming a component, uh, a common component, you should not override the component styles Anymore, you should access the private members of a TypeScript class, which is an interesting statement. And I think whoever wrote this was very smart to put it this way, because what does that mean? Does that mean I should never ever overwrite styles at all in it? I should never even customize them? I don't think it means that. I think it kind of means that just like private member variables of a class, you don't directly override them, but you could still customize the uh, the behavior of a component, in this case, customize the styles. So Angular has one solution to do that. The one solution is NGD. That's the pseudo class that it provides. So what does it do? So it, from the docs again, it says applying NGD pseudo class to any CSS rule completely disables view encapsulation for that rule. And how does that do that? Again, from the docs, any style with NGD applied becomes a global style. So basically think of it as a, you know, a nut and we just drill a little hole in the nut and we pull out that uh, previously very private style and we just basically make it, uh, make it completely global. So just to show what that means. So here, here we have a component, it's a hello component. And you can see in the styles here, it's basically the same code. We defined that hello with a color blue. So now what we'd like to do is we'd like to use the default, the blue, which is the top a hello component uh, usage in our app component HTML. And below we have yet again, the same component, but we would like to now make the angular green. That angular part is green. So the way we do that is we use NGD. So we specify host, uh, we'll explain in a second why, uh, specify the class green and you see the NGD and we kind of reach our hand inside of the component and override the div.hello to be green. And here's the reference to that hello component code uh, its template, and that's how basically it connects. And then we also specify host, and this is something that actually Angular Docs talk about, uh, is because since we know that ngd bleeds the component to the global scope, we kind of want to uh, try to kind of wrangle it back in 
and not have it bleed all over the place, but maybe just to this particular host, which in this case, the app, uh, app that component itself, but we want to try to restrict it just to that scope alone. And sure enough, if we do that, everything works perfectly uh, and we are able to uh, customize it. Now, so this is our solution, right? We specify host, possibly a class, say NGD, and we kind of reach in into the component. So the question is, why is this bad? Well, for a few reasons. Number one, it only works with emulated, not real shadow DOM. So if you ever to, you know, progress the real shadow DOM 100%, this would not work. You also must remember to at least include host. Otherwise, uh, style change will just bleed all over your app. And instead of just changing the color green in one spot, you just all of a sudden change that reusable component in every spot of your app. So that's not something we want. So we have to remember to do that. We also have to fight with possibly complex CSS specificity. Remember, div.hello is a pretty simple example, but regular components, they have kind of, you know, a nice structure to them a lot of times. And that structure follows class structure with the CSS classes. And you'll have to override that. Otherwise, you know, your, the, you know, your kind of reaching into the component isn't going to be good enough. And finally, most, the, the, the most horrible part of it all is that it breaks the whole API paradigm. Now you actually must know specific implementation of a component. A lot of times when you do NGD, you kind of basically crack open your HTML page and see what exactly is the implementation of this component, what's the HTML like, and now you start doing all kinds of basically trickery to get it to, uh, to wrangle its arm to actually look the way you want. So what's the alternative? What's the alternative? So one alternative is, um, is CSS variables. So why is that a good alternative? Well, number one is it's actually designed to pierce the shadow DOM. It's a standard. So it's not just a hack how to pierce the shadow DOM. It's actually a standard. And it's very declarative. You declare these variables and it's very API-like, uh, feels like API-like approach. It also works just like any other CSS. It cascades. So it goes down the DOM tree just like CSS should. Um, and it doesn't depend on selector specificity. So you don't have to fight with selectors and try to overwrite something somewhere. You simply declare. So let's look at a, a same uh, component, but now re-implemented using this approach. So it's the same component. And this time, you know, just, uh, just for the demo purposes of it, uh, we'll just set the encapsulation to shadow down. So we'll actually produce the real shadow down code. And in this case, what we're doing is we're using this variable or the CSS property, same, same uh, terminology, uh, CSS variable, hello color. And uh, hello color is not declared anywhere here. We're just using it. And just in case nobody declares it anywhere, we are going, go, going to go ahead and give it a default value. So if hello color is not declared, it's going to just default to blue. So now the only thing left to do is actually tell the developers that are consuming our components that we have such a thing called hello color variable. So we publish hello color as part of our component docs. So say, hey, if you wanna you know, change the color, here's the, uh, all you do is declare this color variable and you're good to go. You could actually uh, change the color inside. Okay, so now uh, in our app component, we'll do exactly the same thing. We have the first one, kind of the default. And the second one, we're gonna give it the class green, green version tip. Okay, and this is our app component that's CSS. There is no uh, trying to figure out what implementation of the uh, hello component looks like. We just declare hello color to be green and we're done. It, uh, it just magically basically pierces the, uh, not magically by standards, it pierces the shadow down and is able to override um, that var that we had before and hello uh, angular is now in green. So you can see I'm not fighting here with any uh, CSS specificities. I don't need to know whether or not tomorrow perhaps the author of the component is going to want to change the div that uh, you know that that hello to you know paragraph tag. It doesn't matter to me. I'm just declaring and saying the hello color that you published as your CSS API. I want to be able to provide green as its declarative uh, property. Okay, so in summary, component is like a black box. You shouldn't really need to know, care about its inner code. And component styles are best treated like private member variables. And ngd, while it can be used, it's got a lot of shortcomings. It breaks the 
black box uh, paradigm needs to be restrained. There's this CSS specificity issue. On the other hand, CSS variables provide a very clean and declarative standards-based way, and you could customize your components components that way in much cleaner, uh, a kind of versatile fashion. Anyway, that's thank you very much for for listening. And if you wanted to follow me on social media, here are my uh, links. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Jaco. That's a that's a great way to do that. I've had to fight with NGB before and trying to style components and um, have have a it's always kind of a, a pain. We have one quick question. Um, what uh, what do you think the the benefits over uh, of using um, CSS variables are over providing inputs um, to the uh, component that the so the right. input of classes, for example. Right. So th I think it's a great question because uh, I kind of, when I was wrestling around with NGDeep, especially NGDeep on Angular, it's a little confusing because Angular specifically in their doc states, NGDeep is deprecated, yet everybody uses it. <laughs> so when you're like, oh, if it's deprecated, I shouldn't be using it. Well, no, that's pretty much kind of everybody does that. So um, the input, uh, you know, the inputs as that API is a, the natural kind of next uh, thought is the why don't I just provide it as an input? The problem with inputs is that it's really not. It's like you know when you write HTML um, in you know in in some uh, JavaScript editor. When you write JavaScript in an HTML editor, things just don't kind of click. It's just it doesn't. It's it's not the same. It's not the same language. It's not the same fit. So while you could do that, CSS is not uh, something that's passed dynamically in the browser. It is something that has its own kind of paradigm and its own language and its own rules, cascading and so on and so forth. So if you pass it through inputs, while you could do that, it's gonna become very awkward very quickly because now you have to you know, append PX for pixels or RAM for RAMs for certain values. You just can't have that same paradigm of dumb structure where it's going to start inheriting things. Yeah, I'm only gonna declare it here. Things are no longer CSS-y, so to speak, right? They're, they're now become very, you're now living in a JavaScript, a TypeScript world. You're not using the API of CSS. And that's probably the, the biggest problem with that. And you're going to end up just writing a whole bunch of code just to kind of get the C get your JavaScript values back, you know, kind of stuff it back in the CSS way of expressing them. And, and it's just going to be awkward. That, that's yeah. really the main reason, I think. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, you could, you could, uh, you could provide a, a class input for every single customization possible, or you have one class list uh, input and they put it in there, but it's, it can get, I, I've done that and, and it, it is, it is a little bit um, tough. And, and like you said, it, it just, it feels, it still feels kind of hacky to me. Like you were talking about at the beginning of your talk, where if, uh, if the, especially if you have control over this, uh, if you can put in, uh, CSS variables, and then all they have to do is is change the variable. Um, that that is um, a lot simpler, I think. So, yeah, I mean, I hope that something like material uh, material components will switch to that soon. I think what was holding them back is that they were trying to support browsers that older browsers that weren't really supporting this yet. But I think they pretty much, from what I understand, pretty much dropped support for anything that doesn't support CSS properties, CSS variables. So. I'm hoping it's going to come in the future because I think that comes up very often with material components where you just want to tweak something a little bit right here and you end up kind of being pushed into NGDeep, which is not as, as convenient. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, thank you so much. We'll go ahead and move on. Um, while our next speaker is kind of setting up, I'll go ahead and introduce him. His name is John Warrington. Um, John is going to talk about RxJS and Lego art. Uh, John Warrington got started writing code at a summer camp when he was 12 and has been coding ever since. He has used many different languages over the years, working mostly for custom software consulting companies. He is currently working as a full stack developer at Clark Builders, building internal tools to improve the efficiency of the people building the buildings, as well as building solutions to move data between different purchased solutions to improve the ability to report on it. Um, so welcome, John. We're, we're excited to have you here. We're excited to hear. I've been looking forward to hearing what 
uh, we can or how we can combine RxJS and Lego Art. So uh, before we get started, we have one quick icebreaker question for you. Uh, what is something that's expensive but you still think is worth the cost? Well, the mind first goes to Lego. It is very expensive, <laughs> <laughs> especially when you start building larger things. Um, but it's you know enjoyable to build. It's enjoyable to watch the reactions of people seeing displays that you put on. So it's fun. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I don't do a lot of Lego myself, but I have a 10 year old daughter who loves to do Lego uh, sets. And uh, she asked for them for Christmas and her birthday and, and they are a little bit pricey, but she loves doing them and, and she has a lot of fun. So I, I, I agree with that. I like that answer. So, all right, well, I'm excited to hear what you have for us. We'll go ahead and turn the time over to you. All right, so Based on the previous talks, this is going to be slightly less educational, but um, yeah, I'm going to talk about some RxJS with Lego art. But if I'm going to talk about Lego, first thing, the plural of Lego is never Legos. Even the Lego group says so. Um, generally, the adult fans agree that Lego is fine, but you know, Lego actually wants you to say Lego bricks, Lego sets, etc. Um, <clears throat> so Lego art could mean sculptures, mosaics, just about anything. These are actually all things I have built. Um, the Batman and the Minnie Mouse are actually official sets. The rest is custom stuff. And well, I'm going to mostly talk about Lego mosaics today because they're fairly simple. And then what is RxJS? I still have difficulty explaining this one. Um, the official definition, RxJS is a library for reactive programming using observables to make it easy to compose asynchronous or callback based code. So basically it's a way to react to events, flow data through a set of operators that can then transform data without having to set up a bunch of callback functions. To generate a mosaic, you will start with a source image, you will crop it, you will resize to your target dimensions, aiming for one pixel per one stud, because that's kind of how it works. And then you will replace with the available Lego colors or the colors that you have. Um, there will be in gray here, those are the actual events that would be triggered as they choose different, as somebody chooses different sizes, different colors, changes the cropping. So then if I flip over to here. So I've just built a simple little app here and set up some observables. I'm using a component that allows you to choose your cropping. I've got a way of choosing different sizes, how many studs by how many studs, choosing which colors you have. And now as I uncomment stuff, because that's the easiest way to do this, I'm you know responding to the event of the cropping and resizing and Build, you know, outputting a little image. If I change it to a different size, you get a bigger image down there. Different dimensions, etc. So then, again, the next step being uh, so this is using sorry combined latest to combine your dimensions you've chosen here with the output of this image cropper up component and then feeds it through a custom operator I built called resize image, which takes both of those and outputs a new image string. <clears throat> then to do the, I've done basically the same thing. I take that resized image observable, our selected colors based on this pop out, pipe it through a replace colors thing, which then outputs 
in this case, because of how I'm going to do the final image, two different things, an image string that will actually display it with the translated colors. And if I was to say I don't actually have any red, it gives you some funky colors because that is your different, the, the closest matching. And then based on a talk, I think at this meetup a while ago, someone was doing custom SVGs and I decided to try doing that to output what your actual display would look like. <clears throat> so you now if I was to change shape, move things around and you get all sorts of other fun little things. I have brown, reddish brown, gives you a slightly better colors. Uh, but again, it's mostly just piping your data through all the different filters, uh, operators, um, and pulling out the bits you need at the end. The code is actually there on GitHub. And if you want to reach out to me, uh, John Warrington on Twitter. Perfect. That was really cool. Um, I, I like that. That was, that was fun. So um, I'm definitely going to have to go uh, poke around the code. And um, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to Chris, who will introduce our next speaker. All right. Next up, we have Mini Bhatti. Um, Mini, I forgot to mention at the uh, beginning of our talk, but you are one of our newest uh, co-organizers at the meetup. Um, you've done a great job maintaining the meetup.com and helping us out. And uh, you also talked uh, a couple months ago for the first time, the yes. lightning talk. I uh, did a fantastic job. So you've set the bar high for yourself, right? <laughs> um, so Mini, uh, Mini is a UI enthusiast currently working as a software engineer at Cisco. She loves Angular. Her interests lie in making the user experience memorable. In the past, she's been doing various engineering and support roles delivering Angular applications in the finance and education domain. Um, so Minnie, your icebreaker question for today is if you could only keep three apps, which would you choose and why? Okay, then this is, I think the first one would be Twitter. And WhatsApp, now the third one is a bit tricky. I think I would keep uh, Slack or Instagram, maybe one of them. <laughs> Good choices. Yeah, you got to keep the bird app, right? Yeah. <laughs> Pro protect Twitter. <laughs> All right. So you're going to be talking about standalone PDC today. Uh, looking yep. forward to hearing your talk. Take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about standalone PDC. So in the next 10 minutes, we'll understand what are the what, why, and how of standalone PDC. So let's start with the what. Standalone PDC is basically standalone pipes, directives, and components. It means pipes, directives, and components can be used independently of NG module. Uh, that means we the, the standalone components, pipes, and directives can directly manage their own dependencies without the need of an NG module. Uh, it means basically to have a mental model change where we think of standalone components as, as are as having virtual ng module which really exports that component but it doesn't really exist why i think this is more important to understand why do we need it so as we know component must belong to an ng module in order to be available for it in the entire application so so, oh, which means ng modules are basically the smallest reusable building blocks in Angular and the components. This was mentioned in the Angular RFC as well. That means component creation is not just the functionality and the template, it's much more than that. It means that you need to have an ng module with all the dependencies provided. And when uh, a parent component, a child component imports the parent component, then uh, it has to import the module as well. Same is the case with pipes and directives. They need a module to you to be able to use pipes and directives. You need them to be declared inside the ng module to be able to use them in the application. Now, 
as i was saying since a component is no longer just a component it's component plus ng module which means angular has to deal with some implicit dependencies when importing a child component from the parent component therefore build performance is impacted also some might might reason is ng module really is a module because we can uh, violate the rules and perform deep imports to actually access the unexported things from the module so basically the one thing which we ask for encapsulation we don't get from ng module so i have two uh, stack split links sorry for not opening them before <laughs> So here I have a hello component and I have a hi component which has a module dependency involved and uh, in order to import this into the hello component I have to create a module file and import the reactive forms module which is responsible for this little control over here to be able to use inside the hello uh, component but the same thing which I oops, just a second how can we this one yeah The same thing which I see in the standalone component is just a hello component which has the flag as standalone true and imports it has just uh, the men it mentions the component as high component and that's all I have the imports my reactive form module which was supposed to be in the uh, high component and ultimately my hello component is ready to use. So the now let's move on to the how so how does a standalone component looks like so pdc are marked as standalone true which means they don't net need to be declared in uh, declared in the ng module declarations array and are standalone which means if you see the uh, standalone true flag right here this means this is a standalone component it also specifies the dependencies in the imports array which means if you see the imports here it has a capital case pipe and a column directive specifying that this component is sufficient uh, to import the dependencies of the pipes and directive and no longer need an ng module to import all of these the second how how do we create a standalone component uh, so these are the three commands uh, it's pretty much the same like we uh, generate a component directive and pipe we just add the standalone flag to it so it creates the uh, standalone true uh, flag for us in the comp in the metadata the third how now how do we use it standalone components can be directly bootstrapped in the angular applications using the bootstrap application api that means you no longer have to have an ng mod uh, ng module to load your application you can straight away have a component and load it directly in the angular application second thing standalone components can import other standalone components like we uh, like we saw earlier if there's some other standalone component we can directly import uh, mention that component into the imports array and has that available in our standalone component third thing it can be lazy loaded so it's it's very easy to lazy load a component and we no longer need a module to be doing us uh, to be doing that for us fourth uh, it can be exported from the libraries so for library authors there are certain things you can either export the ng module itself or you could export the standalone pipes directives and components so we have that option available as well also standalone components can import existing modules as well so if we we definitely have some existing modules in the application so if we have some new standalone components we can definitely import them in the components and, and continue using it the same way uh, and standalone components can be imported into existing ng modules so our application if we have in our application if we have some existing ng modules we can create standalone components and then import them going forward to to uh, make our components uh, just you know to deal with the components on themselves for the dependencies now the bonus question what happens to the dependency injection so we have so we know uh, we have only two types of inj injector hierarchies one is the elementor and one is the module the element hierarchy is responsible for uh, managing the uh, injectors at the element level and the module it takes on to the null injector all the way up 
So with the NG modules out of the picture, there's a new term introduced, which is called environment injector. Environment injectors basically can be created in one of the following four ways. One is the uh, same way we provide it uh, uh, at the root level. Second, if we, if we have some dependencies at the component level, then we provide that in, in that create that injector for that as well. Uh, then uh, we have, I think in the standalone components, there is a new uh, pro uh, way to provide services at the route level. So that is also a part of environment inject injector. So now what happens to the injectors, uh, what happens to the standalone component, because a standalone component might ha has have their own dependencies. In that case, a new injector is created, which is called standalone injector, which manages it, all of its dependencies. And that is a child of the environment injector. So basically all the standalone uh, in, uh, components will have their own injectors, which will take care of the dependencies. And finally, we will have uh, the up the hierarchy, the environment injector, and then we go up the hierarchy and finally up to the null injector. Uh, so the best resource I think for knowing about standalone components is the is the RFC, is the original RFC. It's it's very elaborate, and I think it has great uh, discussions going on over there. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think we I think I was able to make you as excited as I am about standalone components. Oh, thank you so much. That was a great talk. Yeah, standalone components are pretty cool, and what Angular is doing to move us forward is uh, pretty interesting. All right, um, are there any questions? Now, Addy mentioned that this uh, smells like tree shaking. I think that was at the beginning of your talk. Um, yeah, I guess, how does this affect uh, tree shaking? Is that the question? All right. Uh, sorry, Chris, I, I couldn't get that. Could you please come again? I think there was a question about how this affects tree shaking in Angular. Uh, so basically tree shaking is you, uh, Angular takes care of it. Uh, standalone components doesn't do anything extra because during the build time, uh, any unused things are, are going to be, you know, uh, strapped out. So it doesn't change, I think. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, next up we have Azizi Yazid. Did I say uh, that correctly? Hi, Chris. Hey, how are you doing today? I am good. How are you? Doing well. Cool. Um, so you are a Malaysian front-end architect. Uh, mm. You work for Travicore Intelligence as a software architect. Uh, mm. Azizi loves web technologies, component libraries, design systems, uh, which is why you enjoy researching topics such as component patterns, models, and architecture. Uh, so today you're going to be talking about continuous integration with trunk-based and feature toggles. Uh, mm -hmm. Sounds pretty interesting. Yep. Um, so we do have a little icebreaker for you. Uh, what is the last show that you binge-watched on a streaming service like Netflix or Hulu? Uh, actually, I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, did, I did not uh, watch uh, Netflix because um, in, in, in Malaysia, we have a unified TV. This is a free subscribe uh, when you subscribe the internet, so that uh, it, it has a uh, quite a lot of uh, cool movies. So that uh, I just uh, enough with that. As long as uh, those channel have a, a channel for for my kids, <laughs> that's, that's enough. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very cool. Interesting. It's always interesting to learn about how how uh, different things work throughout the world. It's it's always different in different countries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. All right. Well, we're looking forward to hearing your talk. Uh, take it away. Uh, so, let uh, me full screen. So, hopefully, that uh, everyone is able to see my screen in case yep. that, uh, you know, yeah, cool, right. Today, we talk about uh, the continuous integration with Trump base and feature toggle. So, that the basically the continuous integration is, um, is the practice for us to. Uh, integrate the codes or the words uh, more frequently. Uh, in the common of the practice uh, for the team that uh, adapt uh, the continuous integration is that, for example, if you have the three active developer, at least you will have uh, three uh, words to be integrated in one day. And then uh, the continuous integration has the tools that will verify all the, the integrations uh, through the automated, uh, automated spew. 
and to uh, ensure that everything is safe and uh, avoiding all the breaking change. And while the trend-based development is pretty much the same, I will not uh, um, repeating the same things, but the trend-based development is exactly in the context of the branching system or the branching strategy. So uh, I bet that uh, most of us have experience with the Git flow or the GitHub flow and the trend base is the same uh, kind of the tools, uh, which is the branching uh, strategy. So the context of the trend base is merging a PR and continuously, uh, frequently, so that basically if you have um, three active developer, you might uh, potentially at least to have a three PR to be merged and potentially to, to, uh, to have more than that. And the branch that been used in the trunk based development is called short leaf branches, which means that the maximum for the branch is two days, but uh, the, the best practice is to keep it uh, one day, uh, uh, one day only. So that uh, people always think that um, committing uh, to the trunk is dangerous, but if we have uh, discipline, we have uh, adapting the trunk based development strategies that uh, later on I will explain. Actually, uh, directing, committing to the trunk is not dangerous, but is uh, the fast way to, uh, to incrementally provide the value to your customer and the team. So trunk-based development is the key enabler of continuous integrations. In order for you to have uh, using the trunk-based uh, development correctly, you need to adapt uh, the strategy of the trumbies. They have uh, the, the three strategies that I know is once is the brands by attractions, the second one is the feature toggles, and the third one is feeds forwards. On this talk, we will talk about uh, explain about the brands by attraction and the feature toggle. So we use the brands by attraction to merge a complex or largest scale chains and divide into a small chunk of the best or small chunks or a division of the the numbers of the branches. Imagine that we have the login page so that uh, we divide the login page components like the text fields, components, typography, buttons, and the link into the set of uh, extractions. So this is the complete picture of the uh, branch by extraction in the diagram of the repository branch so that uh, we creating the component as extractions. Imagine that we have the login page developer working with the login page and another developer working with the register, register page so that uh, the, uh, in, in order for us to uh, have the ability for the concurrent development, so by uh, having the reversible component as the extraction will benefit both of the, uh, the developer or both of the owner of the branch. So the, the, the branch is short-lived branches. And once you have created uh, the component with the unit test, with the storybook uh, and the component itself, then uh, after it being reviewed and merged, then uh, the, the branch will be deleted. So that uh, the benefit that you have by having the branch by attraction is that you are committing the small size of the codes. So the, uh, this resulting on the intensive of the code review because it not limit the connective load of the reviewer. So the reviewer will be able to see all in, in, in the big picture uh, what the intention or the idea of the, the one who commit the codes and it enable the concurrent development, uh, the, the things that we has discussed in the previous slide. So now we talk about the another strategies is the feature toggle. The feature toggle are powerful techniques. It allowing teams to modify system behavior without changing the code. This is we um, uh, practically um, change uh, the, the features flats in the runtime. So imagine that we have the, the feature flats either in the JSON or in the database. We inject or initiate into app, uh, using through the app in in a, in a and then update into the app states and the feature flag directive will uh, we go through on the states and check on the value of the flags and and toggle the visibility of the component that will uh, read, that has been read by the feature flag directive 
right? So this is an example of the codes of uh, the, the left side is the, the example of the feature flag. So it's just a simple uh, Boolean value true false. And the right side, the black spot is the example codes, how to use the features uh, flag uh, directive. So for example, if we uh, toggle up the feature A to true, then uh, this will be shown to, uh, to the one who view your app. Right, so that uh, the feature toggle is it consists of a lot of benefits. Uh, imagine that um, you you need to you have an incomplete uh, words, but uh, the the timeline for 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 you to provide the MVP, the next MVP, the next release is 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 due, so that uh, we can just wrapping uh, the codes into the uh, the directive. And turn turn it off and just committing the codes and the code will be safe to uh, to be released to the customer. And then uh, the code base is always releasable because we have the feature flag to toggle uh, uh, true or false. Uh, always re re releasable on demand and help making the continuous delivery a reality. And then uh, because of we having this feature flag, we'll be able to uh, adapt in the practice to commit to the trunk at least one uh, every 24 hours. Um, yeah, I, I think we see one, uh, one uh, summary piece. So in the summary is that um, continuous uh, trunk based developments complementing the, uh, the continuous integration. Uh, the trunk based development is the key enabler for 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 the for the uh, for the continuous integration. If you use the trunk based development indirectly, you are adapting the continuous uh, integrations. So um, hope, hopefully that uh, it uh, initiate uh, an interest for for the listener to use the trunk based and the uh, feature toggle. Uh, that's all for me. Thanks for listening. Thanks for having me. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, it's really cool strategies and uh, good ways to promote smaller commits, smaller pull requests that are a lot easier to review and, and test without, you know, yeah. actually uh, pushing code that you know might not be complete for a for a user to see. Exactly. Awesome. Th yeah, thank right. you so much. That's really right. cool. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, next, I'll hand it over to Alex, who's going to introduce the next couple speakers. Thank you. So our next speaker is going to be Jonathan Garvey, and he's going to be talking to us about tools of the trade, better software through better dev tools. So Jonathan Garvey is a software engineering technical leader at Cisco. He's a passionate software engineer dedicated to building quality software and delivering products and experiences that people love to use. He loves to take a visual concept and turn it into quality code. And he's also a stickler for spelling which he says is probably one of the reasons why he's so dedicated to quality software. Outside of programming, he enjoys playing music and getting into outdoors whenever he can, especially fishing. He's also a proud father of one rambunctious two-year-old who he will be definitely teach programming as soon as he possibly can. So before you go into your presentation, we do have one icebreaker question. Uh, it's what is your favorite thing to do by yourself? Oh man, probably think without any noise or distractions. That's, I need, I need absolute silence sometimes to be able to think clearly. I have a lot of noise in my head. So when, I, when I'm by myself, I like to think. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so we're excited to hear from you for your presentation. We turn the time over to you for that. All right. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, today I'm going to be talking about tools of the trade, better software through better dev tooling. Um, an alternate title I had considered was don't be a tool, use one, but uh, I figured this would be more professional. So this is what we're talking about today. Um, the goals today, we're not talking about fancy web bundlers or anything like that. We're talking about, um, we're talking about the dev tools that I use on a daily basis. And I want to, that's one of my goals is to show you what, what tools I use so that maybe you'll pick out one or two and be like, oh, I'll use that one instead or maybe that'll help me in my, my workflow. But I also want everyone to just analyze the way they write software, think about how they could optimize it and see if there are any tools out there that can, that can help them. So we're gonna go in three categories here. We're gonna have local tools for local development, 
tools for source control and tools for the runtime. Um, I ran through this like five times and it was like just seconds under 10 minutes. So I'm gonna have to go fast. All right, we're gonna start with local development. Uh, the first tool I use quite often is the NX console. Um, if any of you have used the Angular CLI or the Narwhal NX extension CLI, um, you know, it's awesome for generating code, but you gotta do it from the command line. Um, and thus you have to remember all those command line arguments. Uh, and if you're like me and you mess up one character, you now have to do a git revert because there's a misspelling in 17,000 files. So that's where the NX console VS Code plugin comes in. It allows you to generate libs and apps and all the goodies with these. And it also lets you run NX commands from the command palette in VS Code or from the sidebar. So I just I wanna kind of show just a little taste of what NX console can do. This is basically just creating a lib. Um, and instead of guide, remembering all those pesky command line arguments, it literally just gives you form fields and you just fill them out. When you fill them out, it does a dry run. So you can double check what you've done, then you can click run. And that's that. Um, this also works with your workspace generators, um, your custom ones for your mono repo, uh, which is something I just relatively recently found out and that made me very happy. Um, it just integrates right with it. So that's awesome. Um, this is great for beginners and seasoned professionals alike. This is the Angular Set Essentials extension pack from John Papa. It's got things like Angular snippets for generating code snippets, Angular language service for IntelliSense in your component development, editor config for automated formatting on your code, ES lint so you can endlessly argue about your with your team about best practice. Uh, I mean, automate your best practices. Um, material icon theme and the winter is coming theme if you want to spice up your development uh, and a couple more tools there. Now, this is a very small uh, VS Code plugin, but I have come to love it. This is JSON2TS. And as the name implies, it allows you to take a JSON data structure and turn it into a TypeScript interface. And that's that's literally it. You copy the JSON, you paste the JSON, and it turns into a Java, into a TypeScript interface. Not only that, but if you have a working REST API, you can take that REST endpoint, copy that, paste it in, it'll go fetch the data, bring back that JSON data, and turn it into a TypeScript interface. I cannot say it enough. This is an amazing tool. I used to do all my interfaces manually, and that's no fun. Uh, this next tool is called the Thunder Client, which probably wins the best name award in my list. Um, although it's ironic that, they're, that their logo is lightning. Anyway, this is basically like Postman in your VS Code. You can easily create API requests using a UI. You can organize your API requests and collections, import collections from your other REST clients that you've used, test your API calls with a UI with almost no scripting and much, much more. Um, as you can see here, if anyone's used a REST client before, it's very familiar. You've got your requests. You can create new requests with params and headers, and you get your response. Now we're gonna move on to the terminal. Um, this is this is a framework I have come to love, and I don't think I could actually do development without it. It's amazing. So it's the oh my zsh framework, and it's built on top of the zsh shell. So in addition, the, the first thing it gives you is amazing things. Um, no configuration and your terminal will suddenly be the envy of every developer everywhere. On top of that, they've got hundreds of plugins. Um, two of them that I use frequently are the Git, Git plugin for kind of visualizing the state of your Git workspace and um, the autocomplete, which basically turns your bash history into like an autocomplete so you don't got to scroll through it. Um, and then they've got tons of aliases for common Git commands. Um, I, can't, I cannot be bothered <laughs> to type out my Git commands anymore. <laughs> Um, speaking of manually typing, here we have fig, and fig to me is revolutionary. Um, it's basically IntelliSense for your terminal. It turns your terminal into an IDE, giving you autocomplete, just like VS Code would. Um, it already integrates with many of the dev tools you already use, like other IDEs, other shells, uh, things like that. It supports 300 plus CLI tools, so I use it a lot for NX. Like it'll just, when I do have to use, when I'm not using NX console, I do have to use the terminal. Um, I, it helps me with autocomplete for NX. Um, also the AWS CLI. And then if something doesn't exist, you can send it with your own auto completion. And this is just a, a quick taste of what it can do, showing basically something simple first, like CDing into a path. Now using Git, it basically just auto completes everything for you. Um, even works with, com with the actual arguments themselves. It's basically like having a man page, but as uh, IntelliSense. So let's move on into source control. Um, 
GitLens is a fantastic and very feature rich VS Code plugin. Um, I could never tell you everything that it does here in one slide, but um, I'll give you some highlights. So there's file and line blame, uh, so you can figure out who broke production quicker. It's got a feature rich sidebar, including views for commits, repos, branches, remotes, things like that. Uh, it's got a command palette that basically gives you access to every Git command in the book. Um, and it's got an interactive rebase editor, which if you see it here on the right, I could have used this a long time ago when I was learning how to rebase. This would have been so handy. It almost feels like cheating. Now, if you have been a developer, an Angular developer, any amount of time, you know the Angular team has Git commit uh, git commit standards, git commit message standards. Okay. You probably heard, you've probably seen something like this. You need a type, you need a scope, you need a description. Oh, and you need a long description and you need breaking changes and a ticket number. All right. I'm a software developer. I'm not a git commit developer. Fortunately, we have some tools that have our back. Um, two of them specifically conventional commits VS code plugin and the commit is in terminal integration. Uh, the conventional commits VS Code plugin is super easy. It basically allows you to commit right from the command palette, turns your turns that commit message creating process into an intuitive UI, and then even saves your commonly used scopes uh, for reuse. So we can see over here on the right, basically create a commit from the command line, choose our type, create a scope. Add a git emoji because we're cool like that. Add a short description. Add a long description. And the Jira number. Fictitious, of course. And boom, we've created a commit. And now we can go look in our commit history and see that beautiful commit message that we have generated effortlessly. Now, commit is in does the exact same thing, except for the terminal. It's basically a CLI to guide you through the commit message creation process, uh, uses conventional commit standards by default, and easily integrates with pre-commit hooks. So this is just an example. It's almost exactly like that conventional commits tool that I showed in VS Code. Uh, you pick your type, your scope, subject, breaking change, long body, footer, and you're off to the races. Uh, the final final category of stuff is runtime, your runtime dev tools. Now, of course, I cannot do any talk without talking about the Angular dev tools, which basically gives you um, insight into how your components are behaving. You've got a component tree, but you've also got the state of your component and its inputs and outputs that you can actually tweak and see how your component responds. And you've also got a profiler uh, where you can look at the performance of your Angular application. And last, but certainly not least, are the Redux dev tools. Uh, this is a very powerful suite of tools all bundled into a browser extension that allow you to observe the state of your Angular application um, and via Redux, whether that's in GRX or some other, some other framework for that. You can view the action log, navigate back and forth through the state history, dispatch custom actions, view your state as a pretty JSON structure or the raw JSON structure, um, and even view your current state as a chart pretty. So I could go on and on and on and on. I use so many tools on a daily basis, but I really wanted to discuss those with everyone. So in conclusion, you're only as good as your tools. Not really, but your tools really help you. The better tools you have, the better developer you can be. And that's my philosophy, which is why I wanted to give this talk to you all. Thank you for listening. Hope you all enjoy the rest of the talks. Thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan, that was awesome. There's Seems to be a lot of great tools out there to help us. So um, we'll move on to our last speaker today, Alfredo Perez, and he'll be talking to us about making Atomic the NGRX entity. Alfredo is a staff UI engineer at Cellpoint. He started his career doing Windows development and transitioned to web development using ASP.NET. Since then, he has enjoyed web UI development from learning jQuery to discovering how mysterious data binding was in AngularJS, followed by Angular and its more elegant ways to handle components and other thousand and the other thousand libraries he's found on the way. He's passionate about DevX and UI. He also likes to find ways to 
to make code reusable, readable, and enjoyable to help developers get from their first line of code to the launch of quality products. Lately, Alfredo has been getting into the rabbit hole of personal knowledge management systems and digital gardens. So we're excited to hear from you today, but we also have a icebreaker question for you, Alfredo. And it is, if you could instantly have any skill or talent, what would you choose and why? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, usually for this question, I answer something like I learned to play piano or learn to do 3D animation or something like that. But lately I have been playing StarCraft and I wish I had the skills of the pro gamers. Like it's just crazy all the things that they do. And it's amazing. Yeah, pro gamers, they they are amazing. And that would be a really awesome skill to have. Um, but yeah, so we'll turn the time over to you and let you go into your lightning talk. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So let's talk about how to make Atomic DNGRX entity. So let's break this apart. Um, and the first thing that we need to define is what is NGRX entity. So NGRX entity provides an API that to manipulate and query entity collection. So it's a way to reduce boilerplate for creating reducers that manage collections and also provide some selectors. So a quick refresher of how this works. Uh, we have the, um, first we need to define the state using the entity state model. And here in my example, you can see how I'm also defining a couple of custom properties like loading, loaded, and error message. The second step is that using this, we need to create an entity adapter. And using the entity adapter, we can create the initial state and later on in the reducers, we can use this entity adapter to uh, manipulate the collection. And in this case, you can see how I am adding a new friend to the collection. And at the same time, I'm also keeping track of the other properties that I was using. So now let's go to state machines. So this is a model that defines that a system can be only in one state at a time. So if we see here, the state changes for a fetch request, we can see that this cannot be in multiple states at the same time, meaning that we cannot have the fetch request to be in success and failure at the same time, right? Like it transitions to one state to another. So if we apply this to NGRX, then we go to what is called atomic state because it's a single state, single property to hold the state. So where before we used to have the friends state with loading, loaded, and error message, and any other kind of properties related to the state of the request, now we can create an interface for these states and the error, and we will have only a single property for this. That, and this property in this case is called request state. So whenever we use it in the reducer, instead of having to keep track of loaded and, and all these properties, now we just say the request state to the state that we wanted. Like in this case, we just added a friend so we can set the request state to resolved. So if we're gonna be adding this atomic state to the NGRX entity and whenever you use it, wouldn't it be awesome to use it in all the entities by default? So we don't have to create this special property. And if we're going to be using it in all the entities, well, it wouldn't be awesome to also reuse the selectors. So we don't have to create selectors for loading, loaded, and all these different states for each entity. So that's what, I, that's what we are going to be exploring today. So in order to make atomic the entity state, the first thing that we are going to do is to create the model. So we're going to create a model like I showed you before with the different request states that you can have. And here I added a couple of more states. Then based on that, we're going to extend the entity state that NGRX entity provides. And we're going to be creating this new atomic state where we add this request state where we're going to hold the state of the request. The second step is to add selectors. So now that we have all these different states, we can create these selectors for each of the states, like init, loading, result, and also for the error 
it can be the message or the code or whatever kind of error properties do you need. Finally, we're going to create the adapter. So this is exactly how NGRX Entity is creating it, but we're creating a new adapter for this atomic state. And the difference is that it's going to include the request state property, and it's going to include also all the selectors that we previously created. So if we look at this, what is going to be the benefit or the difference between using the normal entity? So in the left side, I have the one that is using the entity state. And you can see that I, I had to be creating all the properties for the state and also setting the initial state. But whenever we use the atomic state, since that was already coded into it, we don't have to define anything. So then in the reducer, in the previous, we had to be keeping track of how we change the state and which one to change. But now with the atomic state, since it's a single property, we can just say, okay, now the request is resolved or now it has an error and so on, right? So we can start to see some of the benefits of this, but let's, exp let's ex explore this into the selectors. So whenever for the selectors, whenever we use this atomic state, we will have to create the selectors for all these state um, request states, right? Like does it is loading, is resolved, does it has an error? Like we had to be creating this state, these selectors in each entity. But now, thanks to the atomic state, and since we already created the selectors, we don't have to do anything but other than defining which selectors do we need from the adapter, because the adapter already has all these selectors. So what is the value of all this, finally? Um, atomic state will allow you to have a single property for the state, and I think that's really beneficial because you, you don't have to be juggling and to see when to set one of the states and when to set the error and, and so on. And if you happen to enhance the entity state with this atomic state implementation, well, now you have less boilerplate and you will enforce consistency because you will have the same selectors everywhere and the same way to manipulate the state in all your uh, entities. So I went really briefly around the how it was implemented, but I have an example application. And if you go to my Twitter, you can see the post there and it will have a link to the repo and also an article describing all the things that I mentioned today. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks again for having me. Thank you, Alfredo. That was, that was amazing. Actually, thank you to all of our speakers today. I, I mean this 100%. This has been easily one of my most favorite meetups ever and it's because of just the efforts of everybody who spoke today